Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, and we're back with more Napoleon's Marshals, Part 5. Uh, this one is actually was a, a, the one that was you know just released recently. Like, how was it, like a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago or something? Uh, and from what I've heard from you guys in the comments, this is not the last one, that there will be a Part 6, which will end up is picking up eventually whenever it comes out. Which I'm assuming probably won't be anytime soon, but we'll get to it, you know, whenever it does decide to drop. So keep tuned for that, for whenever that happens. But the last four have been pretty cool. We actually have to learn a lot of cool stuff, and you know, some pretty awesome uh, marshals. You know, to tell the truth, they're some pretty awesome ones. You know, even some of the shitty guys. You know, they're they might be shitty as people, but like awesome, like in war or you know whatever in combat or whatever. And then there was the opposite. There was this really cool dude, but they're just in, not the best marshals too. So it's been, it's been a good mix, you know, of uh, good and bad here. But we've been getting to the, uh, the more popular ones, the more the ones that can hold their own, the ones who don't really have to be babysat, you know, by Napoleon. You know, they can actually, you know handle you know a battle even if the plane is not there pretty, pretty much right but uh yeah we're uh let's get to it right guys what, who, who we got next are we like top six now or top i don't know i forget but anyways let's let's get to it before we do please hit that like and subscribe button guys please and thank you and yeah let's do this Full screen part five. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's battle. In France, the title of Marshal or Maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority, authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. Hmm. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All Good. 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as Marshals. With expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Remy Pocht, former Chief Historian of the French Army. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Boudinot, Victor, Murat, Bessier, MacDonald, Massena. First, a big thanks to our video sponsor, Surfshark, the VPN that'll keep you safer than a Mameluke bodyguard as you roam the internet. If you're not familiar with Six, Marshal Suchet. I remember that Suchet. Uh, wasn't he the one that, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, he he was in uh, Spain, and I thought that we'd probably get like a cool battle between uh, him and Wellington, and it never, you know, never obviously never happened. But I thought we were gonna get an awesome battle, but it never happened. But I remember Suchet, you know, just being a man who just. I guess, just knew what he was doing, I don't know. Louis-Gabriel Suchet was born in Lyon, the son of a prosperous silk merchant. Plans to join the family business were derailed by the French Revolution. Suchet, an ardent Republican, joined the cavalry of the Lyon National Guard. In 1793, he was elected to lead a volunteer battalion, 
and at the Siege of Toulon, distinguished himself by helping to capture the British commander, General O'Hara. He also made friends with a young Major Bonaparte. Suchet went on to serve under Napoleon in his first brilliant campaign in Italy, fighting at Lodi, Castiglione and Bassano. Transferred to Massena's division, he led his battalion with distinction at Arcole and Rivoli, was wounded twice and promoted colonel. Right. It was in Italy that Suchet learned the most valuable lesson of his career. For troops to be effective, they must be properly paid, clothed and fed, something the French Republic consistently failed to achieve. Despite proving himself to be an excellent organiser and dependable in battle, Suchet never quite made it into General Bonaparte's inner circle. Huh. He went on to serve as a highly effective chief of staff to General Brune, and then to Massena in Switzerland, and was with Joubert in Italy, who died in his arms at the Battle of Novi. Suchet was promoted to General of Division, and in 1800 he was given command of the Army of Italy's left wing. With Massena besieged by the Austrians in Genoa, the defence of southern France fell on his shoulders. In a brilliant independent campaign, he held the Austrians near Nice, then chased them back into Italy, taking 15,000 prisoners. Damn. Despite this impressive record, Suchet was not on the list of marshals created by Napoleon in 1804. Worse, in 1805, he was effectively demoted being given command of a division in Marshal Land's 5th Corps. What? Nevertheless, it was a role he performed with great skill. His division distinguished itself at Ulm and Austerlitz. And the next year led the attack in Napoleon's crushing victory over the Prussians at Jena. The next year in Poland, his division saw hard fighting at Ultusk but was then held back to defend Warsaw and missed the great battles of Eylau and Friedland. Napoleon heaped rewards on General Suchet, money, titles, but still no marshal's battle. Mm. In 1808, Suchet's division was sent to Spain, where he'd spend the next six years. His first role was to support the siege of Zaragoza, then, on Marshal Land's recommendation, Napoleon gave him command of Third Corps and made him governor of Aragon. Suchet found his troops to be poorly supplied, ill-disciplined and low in morale. Hmm. Their first battle together against General Blake's Spanish army ended in a humiliating rout at Alcañiz. Suchet found the drummer who'd started the panic and had him shot in front of the entire corps. He then reorganised his troops and restored discipline and pride with two quick victories over the Spanish. He also faced a guerrilla war in Aragon, a popular insurgency driven by hatred of the French invader. Suchet drew on French experience of fighting counter-revolutionary insurgents in the Vendée and realised that it was only by winning over the civilian population that he'd be able to make progress. Exactly. He made it his first priority to ensure his own men were properly paid and fed, something almost unheard of for French troops in Spain. He enforced discipline and made sure requisition supplies were paid for. He told his troops, I will look after your well-being, and you by your discipline will give security to the inhabitants. You will make them, by your conduct, care for the government of King Joseph. Makes perfect sense. So, like, I don't understand why the rest of these uh, it's marshals or you know generals or whatever. I guess like were they just keeping stuff from their uh, their uh, you know their warriors, their soldiers, kind okay, of keeping that extra money for themselves instead of like supplying everything they need, or they just didn't care and didn't ask for it. Because you know if your soldiers are happy, they got everything they need, then. You know, they're obviously going to respect and listen to their commanding officer a lot more, and they're not going to want to go out and rape and pillage because, you know, they have everything they need. They don't have to go steal it, you know, which makes the people, you know, the Spain, you know, they're going to act more in your favor because they're not going to be scared of you or want you dead or whatever. I don't know.
Juche, I always like that guy. By your conduct, care for the government of King Joseph. He told the Spanish people, my troops will not impede your harvests nor overcrowd your cities. They will live in the countryside ready to protect you. Religion mm -hmm. and clergy will be respected. Exactly. Crucially, Suchet also promised protection from the many Spanish guerrilla bands who behaved no better than bandits. His practical and humane approach won respect and brought results. The guerrillas could never be completely defeated, but Suchet made Aragon the safest and best-run region in occupied Spain. He extended French control of eastern Spain with a series of successful sieges at Lerida, Mequinenza, and Tortosa. In June 1811, he took Tarahona. For this victory, Napoleon finally awarded him his Marshal's Battle, right. the only one earned in Spain. Then he moved south. He defeated a larger Spanish force at Sacuntum, then took the great city of Valencia, along with 18,000 prisoners and nearly 500 guns. Napoleon rewarded Suchet with the title Duke of Albufera. But the overall situation in Spain was deteriorating steadily. The partisans became better organized and supplied. The British Navy was able to land troops on the coast to make diversionary attacks while Napoleon withdrew more and more units for his own campaigns in Russia and Germany. After King Joseph and Jourdan were defeated at Vitoria, Suchet had no option but to pull back towards the French frontier, leaving behind several well-supplied garrisons. That is full. On Napoleon's abdication, Suchet remained undefeated, still holding the French frontier. Wow. When Napoleon returned from exile, Suchet went to meet him in Paris. It was the first time they'd met in person in eight years. Marshal Suchet, you have grown greatly since we last saw one another, the emperor told him. He entrusted Suchet with command of French forces in the south, an important independent command for which few men were better suited. Suchet dutifully kept France's enemies at bay until news arrived of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. Following the second Bourbon restoration, Suchet was dismissed and retired to his country estate, where he died in 1826. He was still held in such esteem in Aragon that a mass was held to pray for his soul in the Cathedral of Zaragoza. Suchet was a brilliant commander, widely regarded as the best administrator in Napoleon's army. He was also one of the few who thrived with the responsibility of independent command. He never had the opportunity to prove himself on the war's decisive battlegrounds. Yeah. But when Napoleon, in exile on St. Helena, was asked to name his best general, he replied, that is difficult to say, but it seems to me that it is Suchet. Nice. Raid is a free-to-play action RPG for both PC and mobile. There are over... Yeah, I mean, like, I liked them. There's a few battles that I heard of, you know, in the uh, episode's lead, you know, in the Napoleonic Wars. And, yeah, it, I guess one of my favorites, definitely Suchet. Uh, it would be really cool to kind of see him in Russia, you know, just, I don't know, on that front, the battles more in the north and stuff. But, like, he held his own, man, down there in the south. It's just, he didn't have the troops to work with, and he just... Spain is just so big to kind of take over on your own if you're not getting helped by, by other marshals, which, you know, from the ones I've seen there, yeah, that were, that were in Spain with him, you know, they were kind of like problem childs, you know? It seems like Suche was the only one who had his act together. But, man... Great Marshal. Five, Marshal Ney. Michel Ney wait, 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 was, a was a true idiot. Michel Ney was a Cooper's <laughs> son from Lorraine, 
a German-speaking region of France on the eastern frontier. His father wanted him to become a clerk, but the young Ney, impetuous and headstrong, joined a Hussar regiment instead. Oh my God. He soon distinguished himself as a fine horseman and fencer, and was a senior sergeant by the time of the French Revolution. When war broke out, Ney was made an officer, and became aide-de-camp to General La Marche. His reports describe Ney as active, brave, and a skilled tactician. Ney served in the Netherlands and on the Rhine, fighting at Valmy, Jemat, and near Vinden. He was seriously wounded once and captured once. Fellow officers nicknamed Ney the indefatigable. His men preferred Le Rougeau, the ruddy or red-faced. The 30-year-old Ney was now a proven brigade commander. Despite refusing promotion more than once, regarding himself as unqualified. In 1799, following glowing reports from General Bernadotte, he finally accepted the rank of General of Division. In 1800, Ney and his division played a major role in General Moreau's great victory over the Austrians at Hohenlinden. This brought him to the attention of France's new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, with whom he'd still never served. When they met in Paris, they warmed to each other. Napoleon entrusted Ney the delicate task of imposing his act of mediation on Switzerland, which he carried out with swift efficiency. Okay. The same year, Ney married Agli Louise Augier, a friend of Josephine's daughter, Hortense, now Napoleon's stepdaughter, drawing him closer to France's future imperial family. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed a new empire, and Ney was made a marshal. The next year, he was leading 6th Corps to war against Austria. He was accompanied by Colonel Henri Jomini, a Swiss officer and military theorist. Ney had been quick to recognize his talent, giving him a job as his aide-de-camp and helping to publish his work. Jomini would win fame as one of the 19th century's great military thinkers, and served Ney well as his chief of staff on several campaigns. During the advance against the Austrians, Jomini encouraged Ney to ignore orders from Marshal Murat that would have allowed the enemy to escape. Their decision was vindicated when 6th Corps won a brilliant action at Elchingen that nice. closed the trap on General Mack's forces at Ulm. Ney's corps missed the Battle of Austerlitz, but was in action against the Prussians the following year. There had already been signs that Ney's aggressive instinct, which made him a brilliant tactical leader, could also get him into trouble. Yeah. At the Battle of Jena, Ney ignored his orders and charged straight at the Prussian lines, <laughs> becoming cut off. His troops had to be rescued by Marshal Land's corps. A furious Napoleon remarked, Ney knows less about soldiering than the last joined drummer boy. Ney was <laughs> criticized again by Napoleon three months later, when his foraging raids into East Prussia appeared to provoke a Russian offensive. Oh, no. The winter maneuvering culminated in the horrific Battle of Eylau, which Ney's corps reached only as darkness fell. That summer, Bennigsen's Russian army launched a surprise attack, hoping to encircle and destroy Ney's 6th Corps near Gutstadt. Ney, outnumbered four to one, conducted a brilliant fighting withdrawal and escaped the trap. A week later, Napoleon caught Bennigsen's army at Friedland. Ney led a crucial attack on the enemy. That man is a lion, said Napoleon, watching his advance. Sixth Corps' onslaught shattered the Russian left, leading to one of Napoleon's most decisive victories. For all his flaws, Ney had proved himself one of Napoleon's best tactical commanders, and was rewarded with the title Duke of Elchingen. In 1808, Ney commanded a corps during the invasion of Spain. 
He spent more than two years in the Iberian Peninsula, and like most of Napoleon's marshals, found it a bitter and frustrating experience. In 1810, he joined Marshal Massena for the invasion of Portugal, but deeply resented being placed under his command. He criticised every decision, helping to create a poisonous atmosphere at French headquarters. Yeah. The French advance on Lisbon came to a halt at the lines of Torres Vedras. During the subsequent retreat, Ney again demonstrated his brilliant tactical skills, fighting a series of rearguard actions that kept Wellington's troops at bay. But Ney's fury at what he considered Massena's disastrous leadership boiled over into open insubordination. He was relieved of command and returned to France. But he did not remain in disgrace for long. Napoleon knew Ney's worth in battle and that the army adored him. He'd be needed in Russia and was recalled in 1812 with command of Third Corps. It seems like, you know, it was saying just didn't you can't stand like incompetence, just like stupid decisions, and you just probably just couldn't deal with it any longer. She's probably so happy just to get the hell out of there, really, uh, and you know, get back to the north, away from this guy. You probably thought didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> As the Kong d'Armée advanced deeper into Russia, Ney was always near the action, leading attacks at Krasny and at Smolensk, where he was wounded in the neck. Amid the slaughter of Borodino, Ney led his corps in attack after attack on the Russian earthworks. When they were finally taken, and he was told that Napoleon would not send in his reserves to follow up their hard-won gains, he exploded with anger. What business has the emperor in the rear of the army? Since he will no longer make war himself, let him return to the Tuileries and leave us to be generals for him. Wow. It was typical of Ney's lack of restraint. But his blind faith in the emperor did not survive Russia. Henceforth, he'd fight only for France. It was during the retreat from Moscow that Ney ensured his place among the legends of military history. Just two weeks into the retreat, the Russians routed Davout's rear guard at Vyazma and Ney and Third Corps took over. Ney was not only an instinctive tactician and apparently immune to fear or fatigue, he could inspire or bully other men into superhuman feats of bravery and endurance. Wow. A French officer later recalled, I can see him still at the spot where the fighting was hottest, speaking to the men, indicating to the generals what positions they should take up, animating all hearts with the confidence that flashed from his glances. He made an effect on me I don't know how to describe. Nice. At Krasny, when the rear guard got cut off from the rest of the army, Ney angrily rejected calls to surrender and led his men in an astonishing forced march across enemy territory, crossing the frozen Dnieper River at night personally pulling men from the river when they fell through the ice. Surrounded by Cossacks and down to 800 fighting men, they formed square and kept moving. Ney was more than a hero to the army. He was its talisman. News of his escape caused rejoicing throughout the army. Napoleon himself remarked, what a soldier. The army is full of brave men. But Michel Ney is truly the bravest of the brave. I agree, man. Ney led the rear guard for the rest of the retreat, and according to legend, was the last man to cross the Nyman River into Poland. His leadership helped many thousands of soldiers to make it back alive. I've always I've loved sci-fi. Time out, time out. And the idea of Let being right on the edge of discovery. Ney was rewarded with the title Prince of the Moskva and continued to serve throughout 1813, though his relations with the Emperor and Marshal Berthier in particular were increasingly strained. At Lützen, Ney was moved by the conduct of his young conscripts, who bore the brunt of Blücher's surprise attack. 
but fought back bravely, helping to win victory. Napoleon then entrusted Ney with command of three army corps, 84,000 men. But the plan for him to fall on the enemy's flank at Bautzen went awry. Badly drafted orders led to delay, and the coalition army was able to escape. Ney fought in the Emperor's great victory at Dresden, but ten days later at Denevitz, his limitations as an army commander were horribly exposed. Throwing himself into an attack, he lost control of the battle and was badly beaten by Bernadotte's army of the north. Ney was devastated by his defeat, but Napoleon kept him in command of his northern wing. At the gigantic four-day Battle of Leipzig, he commanded the northern sector, holding the line until a shoulder wound on the last day forced his return to France. He rejoined the army in 1814 and fought in the defence of France, commanding the Young Guard and personally leading a bayonet charge at the Battle of Montmirail. In April, Ney, outspoken as ever, was among the first to confront Napoleon with the reality of his position and force his abdication. Ney was fated by the restored Bourbon monarchy as France's greatest soldier, but he could not hide his contempt for the returning aristocrats who treated his family with disdain. When the king's niece reduced his wife to tears, Ney confronted her, shouting, I and others were fighting for France while you sat sipping tea in English gardens. In February 1815, Napoleon escaped from exile on Elba and landed in France. Ney was horrified by the prospect of civil war and promised the king that he'd bring Napoleon back to Paris in an iron cage. Wow. But he soon saw that the army was flocking to Napoleon's banner. When Napoleon appealed to him directly as the hero of Borodino, Ney made the fateful decision to cast in his lot with the emperor once more. Nice. When Napoleon advanced into the Netherlands in June to take on Wellington and Blücher's armies, Ney commanded his left wing. But he made a string of blunders. Against Wellington's troops at Quatre Bras, he was too cautious when he held the advantage. Two days later at Waterloo, oh. Napoleon left much of the tactical handling of the battle to Marshal Ney. It was a mistake. On his own initiative, Ney launched a series of mass cavalry attacks too early and failed to launch any coordinated attacks on Wellington's position until late in the day. He had four horses killed under him and personally led the last doomed attack by the Imperial Guard. Ney's courage that day was awe-inspiring, but his decisions helped to cause the French defeat. In the aftermath, Ney spurned several chances to flee France and was arrested for treason by the restored monarchy. A military court refused to pass sentence, so his case went to the Chamber of Peers. With the king's allies demanding that an example be made of Ney, the outcome of his trial was never in doubt. Five of Ney's fellow marshals were among a large majority who voted for the death penalty. On the 7th of December, 1815, he was marched into the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. Soldiers, when I give the order to fire, fire at the heart, he told the firing squad. Wait for the order, it will be my last to you. I protest against my condemnation. Wow. I have fought a hundred battles for France, and not one against her. Man, that is messed up, dude. Like, this dude was a soldier, like, pure soldier. He didn't care about his own life. He's brave. He went there to try to win every time. I mean, he helped. He was saving the lives of his, uh, you know, the men under him, you know, trying to get every last one of them back home. Um, it's like, man, like, he spoke up when he disagreed with something. He wasn't, you know, lying well, in the background, whisper behind people's backs. He was straight up, man, and told people how it was. And 
you know, he fought every battle for like France, you know, for every battle well, for like for Napoleon, you know. He did what the people wanted, you know. He went to Napoleon's side when he came back because that's what the people wanted. Uh, man, to come to an end like that, man, that, that just sucks. Man, you could just let the guy, you know, go live in peace in like the countryside or something. Uh, when it like a G though, right? But damn, I like that guy, man. Marshal Ney was among the most inspirational battlefield commanders in history. A born soldier and brilliant tactician, unless his fiery temperament got the better of him. He lacked the. Yeah, I mean, they, I guess the only like really bad things about him was he made some bad decisions. You know, I think he was just too excited to get into battle, and so we're still waiting for the right spot. Except for that one time where he waited too long, but it's like the decision making wasn't, you know, probably wasn't the best, but. Man, he gave it at all, and he made sure his men had everything, like, and they were prepared and knew where to go and everything, so, yeah. Unless his fiery temperament got the better of him. He lacked the confidence for high command, but under the Emperor's supervision, he proved one of the Grand Armée's greatest combat leaders. Yep. <laughs> Four, Marshal Soult. Jean de what? Dieu Soult. Wow, this dude, not looking good already. <laughs> wow. Jean de Dieu Soult was from a small town in southern France. He looks like and enlisted too. in the Regiment Royal, aged 16. He became a tough, capable sergeant, and in the build-up to the Revolutionary Wars, joined a new battalion of volunteers as their drill instructor. Soult's self-confidence and bearing meant he was soon made an officer. The unit went into action against the Prussians in 1793. In a brutal baptism of fire, half the battalion became casualties, though Soult's own conduct was praised. After a spell on the staff of General Osh, he joined General Lefebvre's crack vanguard division. Soult learned much from Lefebvre, a future fellow marshal, serving first as his chief of staff and later as his best brigade commander. Soult's rise from sergeant to brigadier general took less than three years. In the process, he won a reputation as an organized and decisive commander and brilliant tactician. He also began a bitter, long-lasting feud with another rising star, General wow. Michel Ney. In 1799, Soult established himself as one of France's best divisional commanders, fighting under Massena's command at the Battle of Zurich. He was then put in charge of three divisions to pursue General Suvorov through the Alps, proving his ability for high command. In his report to France's new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, Masséna wrote, For judgment and courage, Soult has scarcely a superior. The next year, Soult and Masséna were besieged in Genoa. Soult led a series of daring raids on the Austrian lines. Until he was shot in the knee and captured, he was robbed and spent days in agony in a filthy hospital. An episode that yeah. may explain Soult's later reluctance to lead from the front. On his return yeah. to Paris, Soult received a hero's welcome from Napoleon. His rewards included an honorary rank as Colonel General in the Consular Guard, plus command of troops assembled at Saint-Omer for Napoleon's planned invasion of England. Soult, the old drill instructor, imposed strict discipline and trained his men hard earning the nickname Bras de Fer, Iron Arm. Even Napoleon wondered if he was being too severe, to which Soult replied, those that can't handle what I myself endure will be left behind in the depots. Those that can will be fit to conquer the world. 
1804, Napoleon proclaimed his new empire, and Soult received his marshal's baton. The next year, his impeccably drilled troops became Fourth Corps, the largest corps of the Grande d'Armée, and marched east to take on the Third Coalition. That December, at Austerlitz, Napoleon entrusted Soult's corps with the main attack on the enemy centre. As he issued his final orders to his marshals, the Emperor turned to Soult last and said, As for you, Soult, I say only, act as you always do. Fourth Corps' attack was the decisive blow of the battle, though its success owed much to Soult's exceptional divisional commanders, Saint-Hilaire and Van Damme. With victory won, Napoleon acclaimed Soult the foremost manoeuvrer in Europe. However, it was observed that Soult was now less inclined to expose himself to enemy fire, taking a more managerial approach to command, though his planning, organisation and tactical instinct remained superb. Hmm. The next year, Soult's corps played an important role at the Battle of Jena, and in the pursuit of the defeated Prussian army that followed. In the brutal winter battle at Eylau, his troops held the centre of the line. Soult's relationship with Napoleon was excellent, and the Emperor frequently turned to him for advice, much to Marshal Berthier's annoyance. In 1808, Soult was ennobled as the Duke of Dalmatia, and later that year led a corps in Napoleon's invasion of Spain. When the Emperor returned to France, he entrusted the pursuit of the British army to Marshal Soult. The British nicknamed Soult the Duke of Damnation, and he harried them through the mountains of Galicia to La Coruña. But in battle, he could not break their lines, nor prevent their escape by sea. Soult then marched south and occupied Porto, where rumours began that he was considering crowning himself King of Portugal. What? Whether the rumours were serious or not, in May the British and Portuguese took Soult by surprise and drove him out of Portugal with heavy loss in men and supplies. This was the most ignominious chapter of Soult's mixed record in the peninsula. Five years that saw sparks of brilliance but also missed chances, shocking avarice, and a reluctance to cooperate with other commanders. Later in 1809, Soult replaced Marshal Jourdan as King Joseph's chief military advisor, and led French forces to a crushing victory over the Spanish at Ocaña. He then oversaw the French occupation of southern Spain. Appointed governor of Andalusia, Soult administered the region with cold efficiency from his headquarters at Seville, though avoiding harsh measures where possible. He lived in royal style and notoriously looted Spanish churches on such a scale that he soon amassed one of the great art collections in Europe, worth an estimated 1.5 million francs. Dang. He was increasingly uh -huh. aloof, and even his aides found him difficult to like. Soult's character is hard and, above all, egotistical, one wrote. He takes no more than a passing interest in those around him. In 1811, with Marshal Massena's army stalled outside Lisbon, Napoleon ordered Soult to give support. Like many of Napoleon's long-range interventions in Spain, the objectives were unrealistic. Yet Soult marched north with 20,000 men, capturing Badajoz, but withdrew on receiving news of an enemy landing near Barossa. Two months later, he marched north again to relieve Badajoz, now besieged by the enemy, and met Beresford's larger army en route at Albuera. Soult launched a flanking attack that threw the enemy into confusion, but he failed to follow up his advantage and left the tactical handling of the battle to others. Nor was he on the spot to inspire his troops, and his army suffered a bloody defeat. The next year, Wellington's victory at Salamanca forced Soult to abandon his palace in Seville and retreat to Valencia. Though that autumn, 
he had the satisfaction of reoccupying Madrid and pursuing Wellington's army back to the Portuguese frontier. In 1813, Napoleon summoned Soult to Germany, where he fought at Lützen and supervised the main attack at Bautzen. But when news arrived of the calamitous French defeat at Vitoria, Napoleon sent Soult back to Spain to take charge. Soult inherited a demoralized, disorganized army. Uh -oh. He quickly imposed order, turned it around, mm -hmm. and attacked. It was an impressive feat, but his mostly young conscripts were up against experienced, well-led troops. Two attempts to relieve the besieged garrison of San Sebastian failed. Soult began a fighting retreat through the Pyrenees mountains back to France. Despite the limitations of his demoralized conscripts, he ensured Wellington's army had to fight every step of the way, counter-attacking whenever possible, and offering resistance till the end, even as Napoleon's empire began to collapse. The last battle of the campaign was fought at Toulouse, a bloody and unnecessary one, as Napoleon had abdicated four days earlier. Under the Bourbon Restoration, Soult became an unpopular Minister of War. Like Marshal Ney, he initially opposed Napoleon's return from exile, but saw which way the wind was blowing and rallied to the Emperor. Napoleon made several dubious appointments in 1815. One was to pick Soult as his new Chief of Staff, oh, no. replacing Marshal Berthier. Not only did this waste Soult's command abilities, since his new role was merely to implement Napoleon's orders, Soult also inherited a complex staff system of Berthier's own devising. Crucial errors resulted during the Waterloo campaign, with orders going astray and commanders unsure of their role. Soult's warning not to underestimate Wellington's army was dismissed by Napoleon. You think that because Wellington defeated you, he must be a great general. I tell you that he is a bad general, uh -oh. that the English are bad troops, and this will be over by lunchtime. Following Napoleon's Let's defeat, stay. Soult lived in exile until 1819, then returned to France under a political amnesty. After the July Revolution, he served as a reforming minister of war, and three times as and I guess that just kind of shows that, you know, Napoleon took uh, the British troops and uh, Wellington too lightly and, you know, didn't give him enough credit because shoots, you know, whatever, uh, you know, he, he knew him from fighting down in, you know, down in Spain. And he knew what, you know, what the what, you know, quality of army they were. But I guess, you know, Napoleon didn't really fight against him because he was up there in Russia most of the time. and didn't know much about Wellington and the British because he didn't really come in contact with them often. But it seems, you know, it seemed like, you know, he got his troops in order and stuff and everything, but he kind of hard on them. And hey, his troops probably, didn't, they said no one liked them. So I'm sure his troops probably didn't like him very much. Part of the reason probably because he might've been you know, a dick and they may, you know, worked him too hard. But <laughs> the stealing of everything, <laughs> oh my God. I bet you he, he was saving up all that art and stuff, man, because he wanted to buy himself a castle when he got home after the war. I guess we'll find out here, but it's like, damn, dude. A revolution, he served as a reforming minister of war and three times as president of the Council of Ministers, effectively France's prime minister. He also became the grand old man of the French army, elevated to commander in chief with the exalted rank of Marshal General of France. Oh. Soult died aged 82 in the same town where he was born, known today as saint amand soult Long life. Soult's record as a marshal was mixed. A brilliant and intelligent organizer whose ability to deliver a master stroke or inspire his troops to victory waned with time. Hmm. Yet he was one of the few marshals that Napoleon could trust with a large independent command. A quality hmm. he needed desperately, but found yeah. in short supply. 
Suchet, Ney, Soult. Join us for the final part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top three coming soon. Okay, well, that's the end of that episode. But yeah, I mean, this is just mixed reviews on. I I didn't really care for him, I guess, too much. You know, I really liked like like Suchet and Ney. I like those guys. You know, those, those, uh, for me, those guys were really pretty cool. Sultan, I guess it's because it's the attitude and the stealing, and I guess maybe, maybe being a little too hard on his troops. It doesn't mean he's not a great okay, general, I guess, the other kind of things might have rubbed me the wrong way, but still great, and Napoleon admired him, so obviously he was really, you know, he knew what he was doing, and he could handle troops on his own. That's really cool. So now more, more cool generals, and we've got three left guys. Which I don't know, obviously means probably have one episode. I don't think they're going to do just one whole episode on one uh, marshal. So one more left, guys. I don't know. I, I have no idea how long between each of these marshal videos there were between them. So I don't know if he was Epic History was releasing like one every like three weeks or once a month or I don't know. I don't know. But whenever it does come out, I'll be sure to uh, make a video on it. So definitely stay tuned for that for whenever that happens. And yeah, and I'm sure if I don't see it, I'm sure you guys will remind me in the comments when it does get released. I'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you that too. And I guess we're on to other things, guys. So stay tuned. Uh, I really thank you guys for watching, do the whole Napoleon thing. I, I know I have a, I've had comments of, you know, I should check out this battle and this battle on this channel, but, you know, we're going to come back to the end of the marshals and I'll and probably end up getting those battles down the line, but I think it's kind of time to get to obviously different wars, probably going to be doing World War One next, uh, you know, but down the line, I'll come back and do, you know, other Napoleon battles and stuff, but it's just, no, awesome series. Time to jump into something new. And uh, thank you guys for watching this whole Napoleon, Napoleon ride with me, man. It's a lot of fun. And it's not over yet. I mean, we still have another episode here. And, you know, down the line after, you know, a few more other series or whatnot, I'll probably jump into another Napoleon video here and there, you know. You know, but, you know. Thank you guys. I really appreciate uh, you guys watching along with me. I know, obviously, as in the comment, I know a lot of you have been here like through like the entire process of me watching this, and that's been really cool and fun to see. You know, because you guys, you guys get excited, gets me excited, makes me look more forward to the next video. And I really appreciate it, guys. And hope you guys continue the ride with me and continue watching. You know, onto these other wars. You know, and learning more stuff with me and have fun. But yeah, anyways, uh, that's it for me for uh, this video. Please hit the like and subscribe, guys, uh, if you haven't done yet. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Um, definitely uh, catch you guys in future videos. It's been a lot of fun. And I'll join you guys in the next adventure. You know we got more adventures coming up, right? More adventures with like new heroes and all that stuff. We know that's coming. I'm really looking forward to that because this is fun. I have a lot of fun doing these videos. I love I have a lot of fun seeing the feedback. And it's really awesome, guys. I uh, really appreciate everything that uh, you guys you know do as far as watching and commenting and all that stuff in general. But, yes, yeah, so I'll definitely catch you guys in future videos. Thanks for watching. Peace.